it's a privilege to introduce Professor Robin Murray. Everyone knows Robin, of course. Um, and uh, he's uh, very well known not only for uh, his incredible research activities on the social, environmental, and biological risk factor for first psychosis, but he has been also the supervisor of uh, 82 PhD students. Most of them uh, have pursued a very successful academic career because he has also been an excellent uh, mentor for, uh, for many of us. So thank you, Robin. So, yeah, yeah, so Marta's going to, uh, this, uh, this is a dual, a double act, actually. Yes, I would like to say, you know, Robin, fine, who cares, you know him. <laughs> the most important person of this afternoon talk is actually Adam, uh, who I had the pleasure to meet. Tell us the date, Adam. Uh, March the 21st, I think, 2019. There you go. March 21st, 2019, no, 2019, before then, 19, 2019. And since we have shared many talks, and also for those of you who come to our workshop this afternoon, many development of ideas and even clinical services, and uh, uh, you will learn more about Adam when the time comes of his uh, uh, contribution to Robin's talk. And also I would like to say, Adam is also the author of a great book, called The Geographer, and uh, Adam will be delighted to tell you what this book is about. It's really about his life experience, and it's a, it's a great book, and we just brought a few copies for any of you who are interested, and because you have the privilege of getting the book here, it would also be signed yes. by Adam, if you are nice, and if you have voted for the posters, by the way. So now... Okay, so uh, so I, I I'm going to start and talk for a little bit, and then Adam will talk, and then I'll try and raise the question of of whether our theories of psychosis actually fit with with the what say uh, what he has talked about. So uh, since we're uh, uh, in in Sicily, it's appropriate to talk about D and G, who are. Dolce and Gabbana, where do they come from? Sicily. Sicily. So uh, they, 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 ladies are smiling, gentlemen are looking blank. Uh, fashion, fashion designers uh, from Sicily, very famous. Uh, but in fact, in, in this context, it's uh, dopamine and genes, which was, uh, <laughs> is not my joke, but Robin Emsley, who's now the editor of Schizophrenia, uh, may, has uh, made this joke. And uh, so these are essentially the biological things that you need to know about in relation to psychosis and schizophrenia. And uh, you'll hear more <coughs> from a proper geneticist uh, uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, Isabel? Yes. Are, are you here? Yes. Uh, but a sort of amateur uh, <coughs> approach just to remind you about genes that uh, in the first suggestion that schizophrenia was multifactorial was in 1967 from Gottesman and Shields, and they were ignored for 50 years. But in 2014, Marta and I were at a conference in Hamburg where the first presentation of uh, the forerunner of these data were presented. And uh, the geneticists who had been in the wilderness for about 20 years were so excited, they all stood up and cheered. So have you ever been at a lecture where the audience stood up and cheered in the middle? Maybe after you, Ad, but <laughs> no, not after, after me. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, as you know, this is a Manhattan plot because it looks a bit like the skyline of New York. Here are the chromosomes along the bottom. All these little skyscrapers are sites on the genome where people with schizophrenia differ from the controls. There are 75,000 people diagnosed with schizophrenic and uh, 101 controls, 263 sites where the people uh, with schizophrenia diagnosis differed from the controls. But the, these are all tiny effects that uh, you may, instead of having maybe like a 1% one, like one chance of developing schizophrenia, if you carry one of the risk, risk alleles, it might be 1.06 uh, 
uh, percent. So uh, you need lots of little genes to make you vulnerable to, to psychosis. I'm very proud to be one of the authors of this paper. And uh, the next slide shows the author list. This is the, <laughs> the, the author list that you may wonder, where am I? There, there I am. <laughs> I'm up there. What were all of these other people doing? Who knows? <laughs> uh, so we, I mean, we all collected DNA from patients, put them all to, all, uh, did our local analyses, then sent them off to Harvard, and they they put the 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 the, the, the data together. Just to show you, this is this was a. Uh, this is what we knew in 2011, 2014, now uh, 20, 2022. And the main point is just to say, where are these genes expressed? The genes for schizophrenia are not expressed in the prostate or, or the stomach <laughs> or the pancreas. They're expressed in the brain, which is very reassuring, isn't it? This in, in the <laughs> frontal lobes and the cortex and so on. So people sometimes talk about schizophrenia being a disorder of uh, the whole body and that people with schizophrenia uh, inherit a, a, a huge liability to diabetes and uh, cardiovascular disorders. There's a lot of tosh uh, because the genes are largely expressed in the brain. There may be some small overlap with Im Im Immunity, but it's not. It's uh, uh, they are predominantly a uh, brain, brain genes, which have normal function in the brain. So they're enriched in neuronal genes, in neurodevelopment, high expression in glutamatergic neurons, and uh, GABA interneurons. Also, calcium channel genes, of course, both schizophrenia and uh, bipolar disorder. And this is just to, to mention that you can take all these little snips, these little sites in the genome where patients differ from controls, and you can take an individual and you can calculate how many of these risk alleles, the, of the risk variants that they, they have. You can weight them according to how big an effect they have, and then you get a polygenic risk score. And this is by, a, <coughs> this is a, Catherine Lewis, who is the head of the SGDP uh, at, uh, at the King's College, and uh, Evangelist Vassos, uh, who is a genetic statistician and psychiatrist. And you so you take all these little snips and you add them up and you get a polygenic risk score. So we can. So any, any, does anybody know their polygenic risk score for schizophrenia? Marta. <laughs> I, I, no, so. Yes? It's quite low, actually. <laughs> you wouldn't tell us if it was high. <laughs> yes. No, so I've got, yes, a good point. So you can have a, a very high polygenic risk score for schizophrenia and you don't develop it. It's just that you're more susceptible if you have, if you encounter adversity. So perhaps if Marta has a low polygenic risk score, she would have to have extreme adversity to be pushed into psychosis or take a huge amount of cannabis or amphetamine to go psychotic. Uh, <laughs> I, but other people could be more, could be more easily pushed in. So you can also get a polygenic risk score for bipolar disorder and for depression or for neuroticism or for PTSD. Uh, so the, uh, we, we, we can develop uh, these sort of uh, measures of uh, liability. So this is a, 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 a study done by Vicky Rodriguez, who was a PhD student of Vangelis and myself. So Vangelis, I show these slides quite, quite often. So Vangelis is now known not only for his capacity as a genetic statistician, but also as a swimmer, because this is what people remember, that his picture is swimming. I, where do you think he's swimming? He's Greek. Where do you think he's swimming? Yes, yes. He's very brave. This is off the north coast of Scotland. I think he was only in for a half, about 30 seconds. But the, uh, 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 uh. So essentially what uh, Vicky did was to take uh, people from the EU GI uh, study 
and uh, divide them into those with schizophrenia spectrum, those with bipolar disorder, those with psychotic depression, and calculate the PRS, the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia, for bipolar disorder, and for depression. So, as you would expect, people with schizophrenia spectrum disorder, the biggest effect, uh, the, the biggest uh, difference between cases and controls was for the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia, but quite a lot for bipolar disorder as well, and a bit for depression. For bipolar disorder, surprisingly, the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia had a bigger effect. At bipolar disorder, also quite big. At depression, much the same. Whereas for psychotic depression, it was is different. It's the polygenic risk score for depression versus bipolar disorders, and only a smaller effect for 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 schizophrenia. So, two thirds of the genes for schizophrenia are shared with bipolar disorder, and at least twenty percent with psychotic depression. Anyway, that's enough for genes. Uh, and don't ask me any complicated questions. But, oh, no, you can ask me because Isabel is here and she'll answer them. Uh, so, why am I showing, showing this? D and Jean, yes, maybe. So what is, the, what is the fashionable trend in ladies, not just ladies, but men's, uh, what is Marta wearing, for example? Uh, uh, show, show what you're wearing. Uh, uh. Dopamine dressing. Do you not know this? That the fashion industry decided uh, that we all got very depressed after COVID. Therefore, we should br wear bright clothes. And some very clever person knew about dopamine and reward and christened this as dopamine dressing. So if you can, you can go for a you can go on to, uh, you can go on to the web and ask about dopamine dressing, which you can get lots and lots about. But here is a, an article on the science and the styles behind a uh, dopamine dressing. So anyway, on to dopamine. So this is a uh, Samir Johar showing what many other people had showed. And I think uh, Oliver Howes talked about this quite a bit, that if you look at people with schizophrenia, they are uh, synthesizing too much dopamine in the striatum, but so are people with bipolar disorder. So that, well, this is people who are manic. Fantastic study. Imagine you, you, you imagine trying to persuade people with mania to lie flat in a PET scanner for 45 minutes. So they're probably not the most off the wall manics, probably hypomanic. But imagine trying to persuade the people who ran the PET scanner to let manic people, patients in, in, their, in their scanner. But uh, Samir managed, I think it took five years to get the patients. I, so the reason we have such difficulty distinguishing between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder is because they share the same, or they share much of the same genetic predisposition and the propensity to synthesize excessive uh, dopamine. So there is a huge amount of overlap. And at that point, I will hand over to Ad. Thank you. So yeah, World Schizophrenia Day tomorrow. Thank you. Yep, tomorrow, World Schizophrenia. I hear representing my demographic. So my problem started in Canada. Uh, I was supposed to be doing a, a psychology degree, uh, but I wanted to take a gap year. So I had to get a deferred entry to University of London to come back uh, and not drain their welfare over there uh, too much. So I, had, I, I was working in, in a hotel, but the thing was, I saw it more than just a, a gap year because uh, I was doing martial arts at the time. And uh, someone said, if you keep doing this until you're like in your 80s or 90s, you, you have such a hypervigilance and awareness of those around you, muggers and things, that you won't need to use your wrist locks. You'll have like a Yoda quality. Oh, this, is, this is brilliant. I don't mind, you know, every week. But the same week I read that, uh, I heard that my, my favourite band said, if you, if you smoke one good joint, you become psychic straight away. <laughs> so I thought I'd go to Canada. I didn't realise they're famous for liking weed over there. Uh, they, they, uh, our terms are quite violent compared to theirs, so we were getting mashed or stoned 
Over there, they get cooked or fried or baked. Uh, they were crazy cats. And I was over there um, with not much of a work-life balance to start with. I was all very, very serious. Uh, over there, though, I'd just say, hey, is this the way to Bear Street? Because all the names were named after animals. And I said, yeah, are you from Australia? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah. You know, just to be popular. And suddenly, I'm sitting on the floor surrounded in smoke, surrounded by other Canadian cool cats. And, uh, yeah, sadly, though, my whole personality had become just those two things. I was a globe-travelling stoner. And I forgot what my actual opi opinions were, my, my hobbies, interests, uh, all these excellent, um, yeah. So I forgot I liked cinema and, you know, poetry and stuff like that. But the whole year, I did nothing uh, unique to the Banff Springs or the Banff or Alberta. The, the, the Bow River is there. And uh, I didn't go hi hiking or whitewater rafting, nothing like that. Half an hour away were some um, sulfur hot springs I'd never been to like geothermal mud baths before, uh, but I didn't go to there once. Uh, I took, on, on my holiday of a lifetime, I took maybe five photos, uh, sent one postcard. Um, and uh, yeah, those photos, they were all um, relating to a, a, an underground, a crash in an underground tunnel at the Bamp Springs for, law, for legal reasons. So uh, I wasn't sort of in, enjoying myself as I should have done. I was surrounded suddenly by all these cool snowboarders and it was like at Prey Ski the whole year. Uh, and I couldn't get enough of it. Uh, you go into a bar there and you get a pitcher of beer. Like this is like four or five pints in one jug. And everyone is like, go hard or go home sort of thing. So I got kind of caught up in all that, sadly. Um, I returned to England uh, with my hair falling out. My circadian rhythm was upside down. I had lost lots of weight. And I was on my way to becoming psychotic uh, over there. It, well, that was 95, 96. September, I made it into university. Uh, I didn't make it to December. Uh, I was too, too panicked by the, the lecturer. I didn't have an A-level in psychology, tragically. So when she asked, um, what is a thought? I was like, what is a thought? Well, she's doing this just to sort of like undermine my intelligence. I was more interested in these extraneous sounds. Like, why did that person walk past in, in the corridor at that moment? Where are they going? What they plan is underground meeting because of me. And um, soon I didn't make it into to any lectures. Uh, uh, so 96, 99, I, I was worried about the end of the world. I started suicide. My reason, I never, I mean, I, I never elaborate on what I tried, but my reasoning for it was um, if I didn't, the geographer, the title of my book, this nemesis, like the god of decay, sounds and power, he would... Um, just uh, put me down whenever he could. And um, yeah, I was just just running from everything. Uh, and these the extraneous sounds were like convincing me uh, that if I didn't take my life, I'd be, uh, my family would be raped, tortured and murdered. Uh, and if I didn't even try, the world would know that I was selfish by not trying. I had to save them, you know. So yeah, the geographer was everywhere. Uh, everyone in the whole world except for me uh, knew about him and he controlled everybody. So it came from a ticking clock, loud analog ticking clock uh, was a syllable for every second. So it'd be like, add them, take your life, da, 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 like continuously. So uh, before long, I was convinced that zero hour was coming, which is when um, you're just about ready to fall asleep. Things are um, quiet, dark, soft, warm and dry, perfect conditions. That is when the door bursts in and the police in SWAT team gear rush up the stairs, grabs you by your foot, dun, 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 down all the stairs, and my life of uh, eternal pain would begin. So I was terrified pretty much the whole time because another, like, these intrusive thoughts weren't helping, but they were only making it worse, and they would come thick and fast or just, like, be there in the background either way. Uh, psychic dollars. So the, I would be the victim. I would be, like, it, an, it, it would be an, a never-ending. I was never going to die because I'd made the geographer seem normal, a uh, human. Uh, I'd made him hate somebody, uh, and hatred was a human emotion. So I'd made him seem less, like, less than a god. So if you came up with like a cruel uh, form of pain or torture or something, after zero hour, kick me in the shin, you get thousand pounds straight into your bank account. You know, no questions asked. Uh, hit me around the head with a block of wood, it's like 10,000 pounds. I would be raising communities 
like in poorer areas, out of poverty, with one like, like let's take off his eyelid and put it on back to front, just um, and I'll be tasting blood forever kind of thing, or battery acid, terrible things. And uh, yeah, this is what was promised to me by every sound, not just the clock, uh, the sound of the wind in the trees, bird song even, you know, music or, and news readers. Uh, pff, yeah. Just like reading my mind and all that kind of thing, very conspiracy orientated. Uh, and yeah, a glitter was no different. Um, I would find like an individual bit of glitter, and say, This is like a little hexagon. And I was like, Government, oh my God. Uh, so I thought every little bit of glitter, glitter bugs, uh, had a miniature microphone and transmitter. They weren't just like recording my no the noises I made, the conversations I had. Uh, the noises I made in a room, just my th also my thoughts on top of that. So, and I had this palindrome phrases thing. So, hopefully, you're getting the gist of you know what's going on today. But um, I would be thinking mathematically, like it's the, num the number of uh, letters you use, no, the number of letters in your words you use, and the order of those words in a sentence. So, if I said University of Essex, that's ten to five. So that's disrespectful. The other way around. Essex University, 510, that's respectful. So when I'm on the ward and I'm um, being served like cabbage or sprouts or something normal, the person who's offered it to me, if they put it in a disrespectful way, I'm not going to eat their food. I'm not going to trust that. There was a time when I was really paranoid about the, uh, the food in the, in the lunch hatch. Uh, if it was tinged with yellow, because I thought I had this Superman thing, that would be arsenic, like, without doubt. Or if it was purple, it would be like strychnine. I don't know about poisons. But to me at the time, it was like gospel truth. Uh, and I used to live out of the um, vending machines just outside the heavy doors in the hospital, which I thought was a shame because they treated it like any other plot. It wasn't as if it was just outside a swimming pool or sports arena. It could have been filled with like peanuts or, or raisins or healthy things. Instead, for two weeks, worried about this, this purple and yellow, uh, I was eating like knickknacks and McCoys and, and Snickers and everything else just out of, like, from fear of my life. I, I didn't have any physical problems. The, you know, this was entirely, you know, I'd created it all. And uh, I get asked why, I've been doing this about four years now, pretty much since I met Marta. Uh, and um, people say, how do you remember all this detail? Like, well, I mean, there's a lot of emotion, like namely fear that went into this. So it's like, a, it's an evocative thing. Um, I thought I was very timely. I, I didn't want to upset the Pope, you know. So he said, we, 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 we know you fly around the world like Superman, for fun kind of thing. Uh, we want to use this. I've got a friend underneath here at the Vatican City in a secret library, all these Latin spell books in like leather and metal. We'll read out the spell. You fly around the world like Superman, like we know you can. And um, then you've got 20, 20 minutes. That demon's in an adenantium temporary cage. Uh, you have to think of your like periodic table knowledge, come up with that perfect blend to keep that particular demon contained. So I'm like uh, cobalt, uh, magnesium, something like that, and then it would be contained. And read another spell, and at this time, I, was, I could have guaranteed that the, the Latin made perfect sense if I'd written it all down, because an intrusive thought I think is a negative idea, and we have ideas all the time. But when they when they turn on you, you know then, yeah, things get claustrophobic and you start acting out because you don't know exactly what's real. And it's, it's pretty worrying. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do movie sushi. It's a little podcast thing on the side. And uh, The Basketball Diaries, one of uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's fa her first films, Juliette Lewis, and, of course, uh, Mark Wahlberg, in New York, he's a heroin addict. And his mum is screaming at him like, I love you, I love you. And she's like, and he's like turning on her. Uh, I didn't make any sense until I thought it through. And it's like, he doesn't think much of himself. If she loves him, she's even worse because she loves such a wretch like him and he doesn't deserve it in the first place. So it's pretty bizarre. I, would like, I, was, I was supposed to kill my mum like a normal person. She was a globally recognised demon at the time for me uh, who controlled the inside of people's bodies. So if she didn't like you, she'd give you indigestion at, at best uh, or heart attack, stroke, cancer kind of thing. Uh, I had to kill her like a normal person. As you imagine, she'd come for visiting time. I didn't want to see her, which is pretty weird. Um, and uh, she would swell up into a massive, like, camper van, well, as big as this room, 
black and green blob pulsating, smelling bad, everything. I had to cut into the middle of this. This specific methodology had been drummed into me by every sound. Uh, cut into the middle of this, uh, get the, the ball from the middle of, the, uh, of this blob and withdraw it and smash it on a rock to reveal a smaller ball inside. Put that where I found the first one uh, and then she'll heal up for the last half hour, half hour of her life. She's like, come with me into my world. This passes by. Cause this is the street that I grew up on, my mind's eye. All I'm doing is lying on a bed in hospital. But um, and then for the last half, yes, yes, trying to... In, in, and then she goes back to her corpse again and the whole world will feel slightly better. They wouldn't know why. All this was drummed into me. So it was, it was inculcated. There's no way I could avoid this. I didn't do anything to her, of course. Uh, too scared which is weird, but yeah. And my brother had another specific way. He, I would kill him like a normal person. Uh, then he would become like a volcanic hole in the floor, throwing out ash and flame and smoke. And then a frog, a frog jumped out. And I, it, because I'm thinking this way, I'm thinking I'm depleting in his energy frog by frog. So frog by frog, but 10 was a maximum. So I switched species and um, like it would be horses, it would be animals, uh, birds. And then finally I went on 10 like, uh, Dinosaurs, because you might as well use him up quickly. Uh, for his last half hour, he's sort of walking around as a flaming figure. Uh, for weeks after this, I thought this had happened. They hadn't, they hadn't visited in this time, so there's nothing to indicate that they wouldn't. Uh, I was worried about where, the, like Jumanji, where these m animals had gone. Uh, people were phoning like the RSPCA and the police, like, we've got an armadillo on the front lawn. The kids love it, but I mean, what do we feed it? You know, and like pterodactyls seen over, over Croydon or, or wherever it is. Uh, and I felt guilty about that. So, uh, yeah, this, um, <laughs> uh, in 2005, this is where the book starts, The Rampage. Uh, I wasn't leaving my flat because uh, I, didn't tr I, well, I didn't trust what was going to go on outside my door. Uh, so I was having like Sainsbury's deliveries and uh, wasn't brushing my hair. So... It's 2005. I really, I got complacent really because my first ever drug, my first ever drug that, that I was given was in 1999. My mum, ah, fantastic. She made the first uh, move to get me uh, involved with the services. So she came round to the flat and I'm sat there hugging my knees, humming, you know, just sort of just completely dis disassociated from my surroundings. And uh, 36 hours later, I'm on, on, a, on a ward. Um, you know, she, it's, it's the last thing you want to do, but she did really, really, I, I felt alienated, not alienated, uh, betrayed. I did feel betrayed at the time, but um, there's nothing else that she could have done. Uh, I, so, yeah, Soul Pride was the first meds I was given. Um, I could walk into an empty room and there was silence. It was so refreshing. Uh, but the thing was, I had the weed, which was the uh, the wild card all the time. I never stopped taking my medication. I did. I knew I had to do that right. Uh, then I'd uh, get high, relapse. Then the soul pride was tinked with uh, more soul pride. Those that have come and gone, uh, a lanzapine, respiridone with the depot. Uh, so you have to take that. Um, sodium valproate. Uh, so so now I'm I'm actually, which is works perfect for for me. Uh, so it would be uh, 400 milligrams of cutiapine, uh, 800 milligrams of lithium, uh, 250 milligrams of clozapine, and uh, 50 milligrams of parenzapine for excess elevation, and 20 milligrams in the morning, mane nocte, for uh, <laughs> gastric reflux. And um, yeah, I, so all of the films that I touched upon again, uh, the, A Beautiful Mind, so this is a bloke who's uh, had got schizophrenia, John Nash from Princeton in the 70s. And the best thing they can come up with to treat his schizophrenia at that time was uh, insulin shock therapy. So they're strapped to a bed and inject him and he's like convulsing, like nonstop for a little while. And the, 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 the psychiatrist of a Princeton professor uh, is saying five times a week for 10 weeks. And before that, of course, it was um, burning witches and stuff. And uh, yeah, with the movies, movie sushi since lockdown, it's like one DVD a week to, on top of other things. And it's, it's interesting because uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest uh, is another one that I did. And I've been in hospitals where uh, 
people think um, they because they got they volunteered to go on the ward, they can just as easily leave. But no, they can't do that. It's like were you sectioned or voluntary? You know, once you're seen by a peat doctor, you you got at least a week on the ward because of that. But the film says everybody except Jack Nicholson's character uh, can leave whenever they want. And when he finds this out, because he's trying to get them gambling and he's bringing his prostitute friends in, they're catching fish from the harbour, they like, nick a bus or something. Uh, and it's these these weird, well, they're, they're completely inaccurate uh, movies. Um, another Truman Show came up yesterday. I love that film. But it's, it, yeah, so Jim Carrey in that, totally persecuted. Uh, as good as it gets, I did also. Um, of course, OCD, Jack Nicholson again. Uh, Silver Linings Playbook, Bradley Cooper, Jessica, uh, Jennifer Lawrence got an Oscar for that, which he plays a, you know, they talk about medication. I realize that um, I'm very, very lucky uh, with hardly any side effects um, except for the two that I'm prescribed for and weight gain. I do lots of walking, I have to. Normally I'd have a slide saying that, uh, you know, this is the swimming that I used to do, but. Um, yeah, also, so uh, Hollywood's interpretation of, of autism is represented by, by, by Rain Man. And uh, also there's, uh, yeah, there are another uh, few, um, yeah. So, okay. So on me on the right on the Victoria Derbyshire show, uh, March 21st, 2019 with Marta. Thanks very much, Ad, for explaining things so. <laughs> So you would never <coughs> know to talk with Ad of what he's been through, nor would you know that he was on clozapine. I mean, I think because uh, uh, how, how many people as slim as he is, uh, maybe I should go on clozapine and <laughs> lose a little bit of weight. But I thought it would be interesting to see how, to what extent our theories fit with some of the symptoms that, that, that Ad has talked about. Oops. Have we already done this? Uh, yeah. Oops. Can we skip over it? Yep. Yep. We come back to to. Uh, to, to, to some of these issues later on. What year was this? Oh, okay. Okay, so how does say uh, striatal dopamine? We, we've known about dopamine since our the hypothesis was in is Oliver here? Nineteen sixty six. No, you said 1976, but no, no. <laughs> I think you said, yeah, I think, I think you meant a comprehensive, understandable dopamine hypothesis, but Van Rossen actually suggested it in 1966, 67. Uh, so the, the suggestion is that this is all to do with prediction error that say uh, we learn by our experience that we we believe that everybody who's on clozapine is a, a, a gets fat and we've just had a, 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 an example of prediction error that a, our belief is falsified by what we've heard from ad a, so when something happens in the environment which we don't expect this results in surprise and dopamine neurons fire to surprise, uh, unexpected events, but not to expected events. And this dopamine firing facilitates our learning from experience so that a particular event is remembered with enhanced value. And uh, this is particularly we come out of uh, the group in Cambridge, one of whom is my son, who you'll, you'll meet tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, yes, or I, uh, when is Graham coming? 
Oh, to, yeah, well, you meet them tomorrow. Uh, and <coughs> also Kelly Dideron uh, at the Institute of Psychiatry. So here is an example of a dopamine, dopamine firing. Can, can we try this? It may be a surprise. Talk to me. So surprising events that these people have learned that there is such a thing as a pink elephant, uh, but of course only in uh, an American co comedy program. So uh, they, they, they are being surprised by this and presumably they would then have a, a, a dopamine firing. So striatal dopamine is the wind of a psychotic fire. Unmedicated patients with early psychosis show increased striatal dopamine and prediction error abnormalities. And this leads to, this leads to do, dopamine signaling increased in the aberrant assignment of importance to unimportant stimuli. I've talked quite a lot about, uh, about things being very intense and birds and sounds uh, and the wind. Uh, uh, I guess you couldn't, you couldn't screen this out. And uh, the old theory, of course, is that people with schizophrenia uh, lose, their, lose their ability to filter uh, and uh, filter out un, unimportant stimuli. Yep. Oh, I, I'm coming and going. Yes, oh, for people online. Yes, OK. So. And this is uh, Jeffrey Gray back in, about, about, so it, really this theory was popularized by Shadish Kapoor wearing the hat, but Jeffrey Gray had said much the same thing uh, about 15 years previously, but in much more technical language. They said, that, but uh, they had said that meaningful connections were created by temporary coincident external impressions or perceptions with thoughts that happen to be present or events and recollections happening to occur in consciousness at the same time. Does it make sense to you, Ad? The, 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 the not only were external events were more intense, but did they get mixed up with your own thoughts? Yeah. Uh, is, especially when you think something is uh, required of you by something that w wasn't even there that, but still functions as a trigger. So you, you react against things that, that aren't there, but to you, it's like it's only right that you do that. Uh, I, I had a friend who was at a, high, a top level um, military meeting. He was close protection apparently for uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. And his drill sergeant actually he thought he shot his desk. So my friend jumped up and put the drill sergeant in the hospital, broken ribs and concussion and things, but nothing really happened. But he didn't touch Tony Blair. <laughs> no. <laughs> so antipsychotics can normalize this dopamine dysfunction and the abnormal learning. And I think what was very interesting is how complicated it gets in your mind. So one theory is that the abnormality starts off in the striatum, but the longer that you have uh, psychotic ideas, the more they transfer into your, co into your cortex. And uh, here is a, a quote with uh, Tony David and one of his students. If, stri if striatal dopamine is not normalized, persistent abnormal experiences and delusional thinking seem to colonize the mind. And that seemed to me to, to fit quite well with the, the extremely complicated uh, delusions that, 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 that you had. So sufferers begin, may begin to expect to hear voices 
and their expectation may outweigh the actual environmental stimuli. So did, did you say that when you heard sounds that that you would then hear voices? Or? They, they were uh, voices that would come from the sounds. Like a cello, if there's a cello solo, there's th that resonates at, apparently at the same kind of uh, rate that a uh, human voice does. So uh, just as cello solo could be like a, a, just a conversation of one person talking, but through the music, the sound of the cello. So yeah, it's very frightening, very frightening. So I have a lady, a lady I've been looking after. Actually, she's actually a psychiatrist. And uh, she, actually, she, in the Britain, you sit your exam. I, it's called the membership of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And you sit it. And she said when she was, uh, when she was sitting the exam, she was hearing voices. She said the voices were useless. And they didn't know the answers <laughs> at, at all. But, uh, but she hears voices. I, when her fridge, uh, uh, she, she, when her fridge begins to buzz, if she's in her kitchen, she's not hearing a voice. She's then her, her her fridge switches on, and she hears the buzz. Then she hears voices. And I have another a uh, patient who I looked after who who hears planes going overhead, and as the plane uh, comes nearer, it starts as a, a sound. Then it, be, it starts speaking speaking to to to, to him, uh, and. You're nodding your head. You've had experiences yeah. like this? If, yeah, the slightest thing can be a trigger. Yeah. So how would you explain that? And the, 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 the theory that appeals to me mostly is say, Phil Corlett's theory. Again, he is a psychologist who came from Cambridge but went and is now a big wheel in Yale. And he said, hallucinations arise when strong prior beliefs exert an inordinate influence over the inferences we make about our environment, creating perceptions where there is no corresponding stimuli. So somehow or other, what you believe is about to happen is more important than actually what happens. And uh, can, can we do this one? So you, don't, you, th you don't think you, your expectations will, will, will overwhelm your, 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 your experience. But let's see if we can... See this one. This is the hollow head. Actually, at the moment, it's a perfectly normal head of Charlie Chaplin. But wait, as it comes round, you'll see, or will you, that it's hollow. The back of it coming round now, it's actually a hollow mask. It appears to rotate in the opposite direction. And amazingly, the nose sticks out, although it's actually sticking in. Coming round now is the normal, correct, as it were, face. And wait again as it comes round. And you'll see this extraordinary thing like Jekyll and Hyde. Both the noses stick out because it's so unlikely that a nose sticks in, that a face is hollow. So you see it as convex, although it's in fact concave, as now and then it'll become the normal face again, there. And note that as soon as the features appear in the hollow inside, it will look convex as though it's a normal face almost, though it isn't. As soon as the features appear, there, your brain refuses to see it as hollow simply because it is so unlikely. And this demonstrates the immense power of top-down knowledge. Power of expectations. And I, I, I've seen this so many times, and I keep saying it's, it's just a hollow mask, and it's still, you, st you still see it. So I keep, I keep wondering, if you saw every day for a year, would you, be, would, your brain, would you be able to convince your brain that it was a hollow mask? So actually, we have a great expert on, the, uh, on, on, the psych on psychology and uh, and uh, psychotic symptoms here, Tony. So, what 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 is your what what are your views on the relationship between dopamine and and uh, uh, and psychotic symptoms? Firstly, do you do you accept the, the, the or do you think the prediction error uh, hypothesis is sensible? And secondly, what what do you think about the idea that 
after a while your stratum normalizes but your expectations you're stuck with the expectations of hearing voices is this se sensible or to a sophisticated cognitive psychiatrist is this nonsense no i i, I think it's a, a very good theory but one expert once said something like, genes don't code for third-person auditory hallucinations. They code for something to do with dopamine. You could say that, all right, how do you get from dopamine to hearing voices in the third person or, or whatever it happens to be? So you do need a theory that's a psychological theory that can turn chemistry into thinking. So one, one idea is this expectation and prediction error. Um, that's the latest one. I think that... Are they you implying, well, it'd be, it'd be around for a year <laughs> or two and then we'll... we'll, 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 we'll. Yeah, I, I think it explains a lot about how we learn, uh, much better than it explains hallucinations and delusions. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a good first shot. I think the other, the other interesting thing is we, we're quite interested um, to hear about people becoming psychotic. I mean, what, what, what Adam was saying was, was absolutely amazing and beautifully uh, conveys what that must be like. Um, and we hear a bit less about what it's like to recover from a psychosis. Usually that's with treatment, but sometimes it, it isn't. And so these expectations that are apparently impossible to erase, in, in, in real life with a person with psychosis, suddenly those perceptions don't seem so frightening anymore. Those beliefs don't seem like the only explanation. So whatever it is, is very, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not persistent, it's not hardwired. These things can fluctuate and come and go, thank goodness, otherwise people wouldn't recover. But some people don't recover. So maybe, I mean, that is the question. Do sometimes these beliefs become hardwired in the cortex? Well, not hardwired, but, but in a sense you can be... Have, I, I wonder when people are treatment resistant and you can pour all sorts of antipsychotics into them, they still have the same beliefs. And I, I always think, you know, that say, people who believed in Brexit you could pour all sorts of antipsychotic into their brain. They would still believe that foreigners were evil. Yeah. <laughs> sure, we should try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, th Thanks very much. Um, I, I want to thank Adam. It was a fantastic, fantastic insight and, and a great, great presentation. I, um, I would like to show it to others as well, if that's okay. That's really fantastic. Thank you. It's on the uh, website. Is it on the website? Yeah. So I, I will. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, yeah, that'd be brilliant. The, what I wanted, there were two things that I wanted to mention there in relation to the, and they may be a bit technical, but in relation to the uh, prediction error theory. Um, one thing that struck me also when I was listening to, to, to Adam was that um, these are, this is not just any associative learning. It's very personally salient. It's about you as a person. There's something about selfhood. It's not that you learn about some kind of object out there. And so the theory doesn't account for that at the moment. That's one thing. The second thing is, and I think Tony probably was alluding to that, is that um, how come, I mean, if, if, if it were all about uh, this aberrant salience and dopamine, high, high dopamine levels, then all sorts of other things that you learn during that period of time and you're unwell should, get, should go away as soon as you're getting treatment with whatever uh, antipsychotic you get, but they don't. So it's, it's particular to those thoughts. So they have some particular status, so they mm -hmm. can't just be mere associate, mere kind of reinforcement learning um, events in the usual way uh, we would say it. There's also some other technical issues, which maybe we can discuss with Graham tomorrow as well, which have to do with the fact that, well, if you update your beliefs about the world, this would have some implications about how you acquire subsequent beliefs. And it, 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 it does, to me, it doesn't quite make sense, but, but maybe, mm. maybe people can explain mm. it. So, yeah. I, I agree. It's, it, people sometimes say, how do the voices know what upsets me the most? And I think of a lady who, who was on antipsychotics, who heard voices that said, uh, your husband's having an affair. And 
she was on depot of antipsychotics, so she had no libido. And the other thing she heard was that the the the, uh, the, uh, the social workers will take away your children, uh, and it will. They, they, they might well. So in a sense, somehow they, these these the, the well, you talked about how the the emotional intensity of the uh, 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 of the the experiences. Anyway, we 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 can we can perhaps come come back to these questions later on. So. Here is a, all, all of, a slide of Oliver's. It's much too good a slide for it to be mine. And so it's a increased dopamine synthesis, dopamine release, a, causing the psychosis. And then we block the, the, uh, the, the, the receptors and we think our job is done. But in a sense, it's, that's the point at which we have to think, what are the causes? What is driving the psychosis? And can we do anything about that? So I suppose the question I would raise is, does the, does the diagnosis matter? I guess probably, Ad, you must have been at, at, at uh, uh, had discussions with psychiatrists or ward rounds where people, when one psychiatrist would, would say, well, this is drug-induced psychosis. Another would say, this is schizophrenia. Did people, somebody say, ever say it was bipolar? What about schizoaffective? <laughs> and, uh, all of you've had you've had had them all. And does it matter? Yeah. But the fact the fact you're on lithium means it, that that the fact that uh, you had mood uh, dysregulation uh, is what got you on uh, on lithium. I guess I always thought that lithium was a trendy drug. Uh, it didn't work for him, but Kurt Cobain from Nirvana made a song called Lithium. So oh, I thought, oh, this is kind of a celebrity's <laughs> drug. Nice. But yeah, it did go from schizophrenia. So you were, you were willing to take it because it, it, you, you knew about that it as being a celebrity drug? Well, I didn't have access to a shotgun, so I was a bit safer. But it did add <laughs> credence to it, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and we heard yesterday from, from, from Alan Young that lithium is is not being used as much because no drug company is pushing it because uh, uh, the drug companies are pushing uh, other other drugs uh, uh, which uh, they would make more money out of. So anyway, I wanted just to talk about, say, uh, is it useful to think of a spectrum and that there is a genetic predisposition at one end to what we might call schizophrenia and at the other to mood instability, but then there are environmental factors that there are rare organic cases like temporal lobe epilepsy or NMDA antibodies, but not very common. Then there's the neurodevelopmental pathway to psychosis, rather more common. Then there's drug-induced psychosis, much more common. I, the social adversity pathway to psychosis, which I don't, I think... I, I certainly wasn't taught about this, and I, I, for, for, I certainly did not teach anybody about this for very many years. I thought that the treatment for psychosis was an antipsychotic. I, and then, of course, there's affective psychosis, and there's the hormonal, uh, horm hormonal causes of psychosis, such as postpartum. And then we heard again yesterday about the possibility that the later peak in women is related to menopause. So just uh, talking a little bit about, say, uh, there is a, uh, uh, Dr. DeForti. Actually, it's just a comment. I'm thinking about going back to the points that Tony and Argiris were making, that say there is a sort of a, a prediction error component or, or, or sort of a cognitive element that is uh, uh, underlying the development of some of uh, the experiences that Adam was sharing with us. And so why, when people get better, only some of these, or the, the, the experiences that were associated with the heal state go and no others. And I was wondering how much the etiology, so the, the pathway that gets you to psychosis, might has a role in which are the beliefs that stay with you and the one that then go. And I was thinking about uh, when we look at people who develop psychosis in the context of trauma, and Julia would be our expert on this, or even if I think about, and Adam knows, some of the people, Adam, you and I know, who have developed cannabis in the context of smoking uh, cannabis, sorry, have developed psychosis in the context of smoking cannabis in an inner city apartment where there are gangs outside. So, and, and their delusional system would be in the context of, of where they live. 
and when they, 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 they are better, uh, in some way, the, the degree of the delusion uh, and, and the perception of being under threat goes away and they're able to cope with the environment. But uh, in some way, the context of the psychosis was very relevant to their social context. Not just... <laughs> And who, who was it that said that South London was psych psychotogenic? So our side to it. Uh, it was David Taylor this morning. Well, should should we ask Adam? How did your delusions go away? I mean, did, did they go away over a couple of weeks, or did they go over, away oh, over eighteen months, or what? If only it was the overnight. If only. No, it took it took years. It took what well, months and months because that zero hour concept being snatched from your bed every night. You're waiting for that. So over time, I was like, well, it didn't happen yesterday. And the next day, I was like, it didn't happen. Are happen you on either. treatment at this point? Uh, yeah. So yeah, you were getting the antipsychotic, but yeah. you're still having these experiences yeah. or these beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was the passage of time, really. But uh, the medications did give me a, a, a sort of a strong baseline that I could rely upon, which was good. Very good. Psychological? Psychology, any help? Uh See, yeah, I thought the information all would be all totally parallel and made up. This information, if I told a psychiatrist about it, then I would be implicating them. They would have this potent knowledge. Uh, but it only really worked as when I instigated the, 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 the talk with the counsellor. But, um, yeah, it, it's just time passing, really. It didn't happen last week. Why would it happen tonight? And it went on and on. And That's then I learned that you do okay. good things... You so you were believing it every it was going to happen every evening, and after a while, you you sort of realised, well, it didn't happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It was a brilliant feeling. So, I, I mean, obviously, this is not a <coughs> the type of psychosis that Adam has had, but we know that uh, there's a neurodevelopmental pathway to psychosis, so that people can have a. Uh, obstetric events or other things that may cause some impairment of the cor cortical development. Uh, they can have copy number variants. And there is also this question that if you have lower IQ, this goes back actually to discussions I used to have with Tony David 20 years ago, that does low IQ increase your risk of psychosis? And I think I think the evidence is that it does, that if you're, if you're having paranoid, if you're having experiences that are paranoia inducing and you're clever, you can think your way out of it. But if you're not very clever, then uh, you, you increasingly, uh, increasingly believe it. And interestingly, the genetics of cognition in schizophrenia, what, what, what polygenic risk score uh, has the most influence on the, our cognition in people with schizophrenia? Polygenic risk score for going to the gym. Polygenic risk score for neuroticism. Polygenic risk score for IQ. So if you look at people who, uh, uh, with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, the bulk of their variance in cognition is determined by just by bad luck that they tended to have uh, genes which made their IQ lower. Then there's an additional effect of the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia, but it's mostly down to the polygenic risk score for, for IQ. So in some... No, it is in everybody. If you take uh, people for schizophrenia... Come to psychosis, for instance, where cannabis is an important component, where IQ is pretty good. I'm right. Well, they but they and they these folk inherited quite good, quite good genes for IQ. They went psychotic not because they had a low. I, I see what I see the point you're making. Sorry, I was a bit slow. My I, I, my, my, my genes weren't quite as good as, or maybe it's more aging. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we suggested way back in 1987 that there might be a neurodevelopmental component, and one of my bugbears is that. Uh, this, in a sense, has, was, has been a too successful uh, hypothesis because lots of people think schizophrenia is a neurodevelopmental disease. You open any 
any biological textbook or neuroscience paper. It says schizophrenia is a neurodevelopmental disorder which is associated with deterioration and uh, incapacity. Uh, but this is not, 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 well, it's certainly not deteriorating necessarily. And also only a, pro a proportion of people with schizophrenia had any neurodevelopmental problems. Oops, sorry, right. Uh, so there's a pre-morbid type. Actually, it, it, it's, it, it was Tony David went on for so long. <laughs> no. Then there's a social pathway, uh, trauma, migration, adversities of all sorts of types. Antidepressants may help. A CBT also may help, excuse me. And then there's drug-induced psychosis. And we're going to hear about this at much greater length from Dr. DeForte and Ad, Ad again. But uh, one minute. There. Let me just show you. So you, you know this slide that uh, the incidence of psychosis follows the, the, the prevalence of uh, cannabis in different parts of Europe. Does this work for all enjoyable substances? Does psychosis track other enjoyable substances? What is the best thing about a Palermo food? It is a ice cream. So what is the relationship between daily ice cream and the incidence of psychosis? I would like to hear Professor Aus to answer this question. Oliver, what do you think it is? What's the relationship? Well, wake up, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Is, is ice cream better than cannabis? Yes. yes. No, no, but does, does ice cream have any relationship whatsoever with the incidence of psychosis? Well, I've seen it before, so I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, clearly it can't. It, there is a relationship. There it is, very clear. So this is daily consumption of ice cream in London, less than 5% of the population. Madrid, a bit higher. And a uh, Palermo, more than 50% of the population take a daily ice cream. Why is the incidence of psychosis so low in Palermo? Is there a relationship? Uh, and here is, it's very high in London. So while, while you're here in Palermo, make the most of the antipsychotic effects of, 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 of ice cream. Anyway, I, I stop at this point. So uh, now you have, uh, if you like, a coffee break, which is not compulsory, and he implies crossing the road to the little bar. So if people have questions and want to stay and want to ask Adam and Robin question, maybe we can do five minutes of question. But if people need caffeine to be awake until 4.30, you can start making your, your way, because we will need to start with the workshop on time at 3.30. Uh, uh, no, 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 it's free. The coffee is free. So you just go there. They need to see that you have a badge and then you can get coffee or tea and then there will be, of course, there'll be some biscuits as well. I have a question for Adam. Yeah, I'm just waiting till you... Are you ready to answer? Yeah? Oh. Yes, you sir. clearly have fantastic insight. What tips can you give to psychiatrists and psychologists to help young men particularly develop insight? I don't know. One, one of my favourite parts of recovery was learning that if, if I, that the, I guess it would cause it causality. You do something, and something else happens because of that. You know, you do a favour for someone, and they're pleased, and you feel you feel they're grateful, and it's that sort of you, A B C D E F. It, these things move like that, and if you do something nasty, then maybe it'd be living karma too. 
and it's just the way that that uh you know it takes that first domino push and everything else falls after that it, the practicality of life i think it is in the in the, the 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 clip that wasn't actually played it's like when i was when i was recovered i could walk into like i don't know piccadilly circus or something like that and no one knew me uh there was a disconnect and unless i wanted them to and said hello to one of them you know it w w when when there was practical results uh and i wasn't sort of guessing i i wasn't imagining what other people are thinking about me if they're thinking about me at all you know uh things made a lot more sense when when you're disconnected from from public what was the most helpful thing that made you continue your medication uh well it was just a phrase really i mean because i'm on clozapine every four weeks i get you know vital signs tested and stuff and make sure i'm taking it and for the nurse to say looks like you've got no 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 uh, right side effects keep doing what you're doing it was just such a helpful phrase it was like no one's ever said that before because in the past all of that i could remember i wasn't doing then they, they would discontinue what you're doing you know so uh you know reassurances uh were really good and having something to look forward to uh even if it's like a takeaway every two weeks or something uh something you could you can I, yeah something you can look forward to thank you because I'm an expert in the field since last two seconds. No, actually it's not. I haven't been talking about clozapine and craving. So with, you know, with Diego, Adam, uh, uh, Robin, and actually Julian Eduardo, we are involved in this uh, uh, project, which is the cannabis clinic for people, actually David Taylor, uh, for psychosis. And all of the young people that come, or young adults, I should say, that come to the clinic by definition have had cannabis prior to the onset and have continued following the onset of psychosis. And when we talk together about which medication might, might be more suited to, to them, not just because of the psychosis, but because we know from many neuroimaging actually studies that there are differences in the dopamine system in people with dual diagnosis, including people with cannabis dependence and psychosis compared to people just with psychosis. Heavy dopamine blocker doesn't help. Uh, and we've had this sometimes, this gets people into a circle of getting more and more higher doses of antipsychotic and pushing people into greater craving. So when you look at the literature of medication that has been recommended for dual diagnosis, both to help with the psychosis, but also with the management of the substance, and particularly the craving, clozapine has come the top. Nevertheless, partial agonists follow quite closely, and there be some suggestion that perhaps partial agonists at the D3 receptor, who has been linked to craving in addiction, might be more suited. Uh, and so sometimes with Adam, we have discussed if actually clozapine has been for him also an helpful choice because I have supported him in sustaining his decision of stopping cannabis, which has now been, what, 12 years? Thirteen, yeah, over, yeah, yeah, thirteen years of uh, which has been another sort of game changer in uh, in the post Adam recovery. So Oliver was talking yesterday, but we now know that the excessive dopamine synthesis is mostly in the associative striatum. So we, blo if you give something like risperidone you, with a, or haloperidol, you're blocking very effectively the associative striatum, but you're also blocking the ventral striatum. And the ventral striatum, and the, if, you're ad, if you're addicted to a drug, your dopamine levels in your ventral striatum are low, which is why you get a craving, because you want something to push them up. So we're in some ways exas can exacerbate the craving by accidentally uh, blocking the, uh, the, 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 the dopamine in those people who already are, are suffering from a low dopamine in the, in the ventral striatum. Though goodness knows why they, got, they, they develop psychosis with low dopamine in the striatum. Is there an answer, Oliver? Yes, in, in short, no. 
No, right, okay. Uh, any more questions? Let someone else go, because I can always talk later. Well, Adam, I was going to ask you, what's it like taking an antipsychotic? What do you notice first? Uh, it was so long ago that I first had them. Uh, I, th I think it's just like, well, you, you realize how close you came, how serious you were about uh, these nightmares always around you that you wake up in the morning and it's like, what can, what can this day bring me? What can I bring this day? You know, I'm happy to be alive sort of thing. Although my life was never physically under threat. But it's just an appreciation uh, that the, wor the, world, the world is a world and it's a lovely world. And uh, who are you not to feel happy? Uh, I can make it up to those, those around me and uh, just rewards coming from good behavior. I it thought, sounds. Adam, you said when you were, I think Oliver had not arrived yet, you said that when you, fir you were first given amisulpride, is that right? Sulpride. And you, 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 I think you used the term, you felt some peace. Yeah, I the, walked into an empty room and there was yeah. silence. Yeah. It was very, but of course I was addicted to weed, so I, I negated the effect and relapsed again. But sulpride probably would have cured me if I had any sense. Thank you. Any, Alex? Uh, thanks so much for being uh, so bold and brave to talk to us about your experiences. Thank you. thanks, so thanks. most doctors have sworn a Hippocratic Oath to first do no harm. My question is, what harmful things have we done uh, that uh, maybe is a waste of resources and time? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, I couldn't really explain my psychiatrist's decisions. No, <laughs> what I mean is I'm sure that some things were helpful to you, but some things were not so helpful. Um, so we, it'd be helpful if uh, I can probably do less of the unhelpful things. Of course. Future. You mean like, well, sometimes norm well, sometimes normalizing a narcissist's uh, problems, their, their delusions, it would have been nice instead of like, yeah, everyone feels that way. If you say like, I've never heard that before. This is quite remarkable. I should tell my colleagues about this. You know, it's a little bit of uh, flamboyance perhaps. No, I mean, Again, continuity of care. If I had this, if they went locum after locum, different, they'd some read the notes, but it's just some like, I'm gonna judge him on face value. Uh, but of course, it's starting a, a, a whole therapeutic relationship from scratch every time. So to have uh, that continuity of care would be good. But obviously that's out of, out of the psychiatrist's hands also. Did you get it eventually? Uh, I think so, yeah. Um, I, like the, I like the language that was used because I get copied into my uh, psychiatrist, it's, writes letters to my GP, and it's like, it, it went well. I thought I'd gotten pretty well with my doctor. And he's like, Adam presented as euthymic. I had to look, look up euthymic. <laughs> Adam's mood, Adam's mood was unremarkable. I'm like, yes, <laughs> this is great. So if you're sitting in a room with a schizophrenic person, they've got a history of violence, and nothing gets thrown across the room, nothing gets smashed for 20 minutes, then that's a plus. And the best kind of de-escalation de is small talk and, ha and like happiness and stuff, rather than obviously wrist locks and stuff like that. So the good nurses especially can keep the peace. It's, it's a lot less effort. <laughs>